that howling call, one we can all imagine, has brought fear to humankind for hundreds of millennia. Long before we civilised this world, even before we left the grasslands of the savannah, we were stalked as prey. This creature only rivals us in its complex relationship dynamics and its ability to coordinate a hunt. Maybe that is why we hold the wolf in such revenance in cultures across the world, because it is not impossible to imagine a world where the great apes never ascended to the lofty heights we find ourselves, and instead the canine became the king of these lands. The wolf mystifies us, probably because we see a lot of ourselves in them, their cunning, their tenacity, and occasional primal ferocity. It should come at no surprise that in our folklore and mythology, the delineation between these two apex predators often merge, and the werewolf is born. A figure who is haunted to transform under pale moonlight into the very monster that would watch from the forest, its jaw glistening with wanton saliva, its eyes flickering from the cast firelight. A werewolf, to engage in specifics, is a folkloric creature who has the ability to change from human form into that of a wolf or a theranthropic wolf-like form. This affliction is usually the result of a curse from a witch or even a god, or infection, where the recipient is compelled to transform under the light of a full moon during a ritual, and in some cases they can control their metamorphosis. A particular pattern I have begun to recognise whilst researching mythical and folkloric creatures is that they always seem to represent a devolution or corruption of humanity. Their unnervingness always lives in a kind of uncanny valley, a primal, monstrous reflection between man and beast. With giants, we recognise the brutish, ferocious lineage Homo sapiens could have walked down. With zombies, we are forced to witness the nightmare of what we would become if the very essence of us, our personality and intellect, was taken from us. With werewolves, we once again see a devolution, but in this case, we lose every aspect of ourselves and transform into Canis, the animal we arguably have the most complex, symbiotic and ancient relationship with. There are scientific explanations as to why the line between human and wolf apparently sometimes blur. Hypertrichosis is a usually genetic condition characterised by excessive hair growth around the entire body. This condition itself does not limit the person's lifespan, but historically has meant they were viewed with suspicion and ostracised by their communities, facing discrimination, physical and psychological abuse. Petrus Gonsalves, born in 1537 CE, is the earliest known person afflicted with this condition and was referred to as the Wild Gentleman of Tenerife and the Canarian Werewolf in his time. He was gifted to King Henry II of France in 1547, and later married one of Catherine de Demisi's ladies-in-waiting, possibly later inspiring the fairy tale Beauty and the Beast. There is also the condition of clinical lycanthropy, a psychiatric syndrome in which the patient has the delusional belief of themselves turning into a wolf, there have only been 43 documented cases of this delusion since antiquity, but it is more than likely a cultural influence on an already established psychotic disorder. Essentially, a person suffers a psychotic episode believing themselves to be a werewolf because werewolves are prominent in our global cultures, not the reverse. Also, of course, there is the deadly virus rabies which is usually transmitted via the saliva and therefore bite of a rabid animal. Symptoms of this virus include agitation, confusion, hyperactivity, excessive salvation and hallucinations, to name a few. Considering these symptoms and the alienation of a community one afflicted would face considering the lack of scientific knowledge pre-enlightenment people had, it is not difficult to imagine how fairy tales of bestial transformations occurred. As accounts of the indigenous American Blackfoot people stated, it is said that wolves, which in former days were extremely numerous, sometimes went crazy, even coming into camps and biting dogs, horses and people. Persons bitten by a mad wolf generally went mad too. They trembled, 
and their limbs jerked. They made their jaws work and foamed at the mouth, often trying to bite other people. Werewolves have most likely existed in our cultures deep into prehistory. Examples of human-animal hybrids, or theranthropes, are found as cave paintings and petrographs that date back over 45,000 years ago. These instances are found across Europe, the Middle East, South Africa, and all the way to Australia. A statue of a man with a feline head, made out of a mammoth tusk and dated back to 30,000 years BCE, was recently located in a cave in Germany. Meanwhile, the oldest known cave art, found in Indonesia, depicts a hunting scene of buffaloes and pigs fleeing from a human-like creature with a bird's head and another with a tail. According to Caroline Taylor Stewart in her essay The Origin of the Werewolf Superstition, there seems to be a subconscious predilection in our cultures globally to create such a creature, but with a local context. For instance, in East Africa, people transform into lions, West African people turn into leopards, and the Awak people of South America transform into jaguars. Wolves specifically would have been feared, but also respected as an apex predator by ancient man. This admiration would have, in some instances, evolved into the creation of wolf cults, where the wolf would have been worshipped as a corporeal deity. Worship of these creatures would have varied from sacrifices and offerings to religious ceremonies. During these ceremonies, people would have danced themselves into hypnotic trances, similarly to the modern sand people of South Africa. Further compelled by shared religious ecstasy and possibly mind-altering hallucinogens, it is not inconceivable that primitive humans imagined their kin transforming into the ferocious beasts they idolised. This transformation is no more apparent than in the Koyos, a rite of passage in Proto-Indo-European culture during the late Neolithic age, 6400 to 3500 BCE. In this ritual, adolescent men would be grouped with a dozen or so of their contemporaries and sent out into the wilderness with weapons as their only possessions. For years at a time, they would have a tangential relationship with their original tribe, living solely from the land, raiding neighbouring communities and returning plunder to their own seasonally. Societal taboos like stealing, murder and rape were permitted during this time, as long as they didn't impact the host society. Most relevantly though, this warband would don wolf furs and in a metaphorical sense would become as feral as the animals of which pelt they wore. This is why they were able to act with such uncompassionate animalistic cruelty, because they regarded themselves as no longer human. It is much easier to go into war imagining yourself to be a wild animal than the teenager you are, says Old Norse literature expert Ardenheda Gudenstofte of the University of Iceland. This was a time where humans still viewed themselves as an intrinsic part of the animal kingdom, as opposed to a later, more isolated perspective influenced by the Abrahamic religions, and thus the proximity between man and beast was less delineated. It should be no surprise that this was a passage to manhood, as, in a tale as old as time, these young men would have had the motivations and physical prowess of an adult human, but not the wisdom and social status to satiate such mature desires. They were not yet men, nor were they boys. Just like the wolf, they were uncontrollable, swift, and without fear. This disassociation with humanity ended as the boys reached full maturity and were once again incorporated into the tribe. This would be officiated by a marriage ceremony, where they were now considered fecund and property-owning. In the interest of transparency, it should be stated that the theory of the Kronos is largely theoretical, being speculated from linguistics and mythology. It was never a constant-spanning warband, but much more likely to be an example of convergent cultural evolution. In a particular trend for this series, the oldest recorded textual reference we have of a werewolf-like curse comes from the Epic of Gilgamesh, an ancient Sumerian poem from 2100 BCE. In the relevant passage, Gilgamesh rebuffs the advances of Ishtar, the goddess of war and sexual love. He does so while recounting the story of what happened to a previous suitor of Ishtar's, a shepherd who had left her countless offerings. You have loved the shepherd of the flock. He made meal cake for you day after day, 
He killed kids for your sake. You struck and turned him into a wolf, and now his own shepherd boys chase him away. His own hounds worry his flanks. This tale is often not regarded as the most ancient of werewolf stories, as it does not fit the classical archetype. I personally don't agree with this perception, as surely being transformed into a wolf to be harassed and ostracised by the community one was once a part of is the common theme of most werewolf tales. I feel this exemplifies the undercurrent of the werewolf myth perfectly. The subconscious anxiety that we as a human may be ostracised, chased away from our communities and forced to live as a primal animal and scavenge in and about the wilderness. According to Herodotus, in his work Histories, written in 430 BCE, a tribe called the Nurai, located in northeast Scythia, modern Ukraine, transformed into wolves for a few days of the year. He once stated that the tribe had little sense of civilization, with no laws or customs, travelled as a migratory pack, dressed in black, and apparently feasted on human flesh. Given the bastion of civility that Herodias came from, he would perceive archaic, regional tribes as backwards and primal, and them being cannibalistic wouldn't be too far of a stretch of the imagination from his vantage point. This assumption would only have been further verified by the fact that the tribe was migratory and dressed predominantly in the furs of the animals they hunted, making themselves as similar to a wolf pack as it was possible to become. These people probably worshipped the wolf similarly to how Proto-Indo-European cultures would have, and as the Greek region of Arcadia worshipped Zeus, as a hybrid animal form called Lycaean Zeus, or Wolf Zeus. Across the Black Sea, in what eventually would become modern-day Turkey, werewolves were, in a rare instance, revered. The wolf was a totemic ancestor of the Turkish people. They believed that if a shaman was to conduct an arduous rite, they would be able to transform into a wolf or a kurtadam. The antiquarian Arcadian tribes of modern South Greece revered wolves as their primeval deity. This would later go on to influence the ancient Greek mythologies and gods, specifically the god Apollo, whose mother was a she-wolf. In 380 BCE, Plato recounted the tale of Demarchus, a protector of the Lycaean Zeus shrine and an eventual Olympic boxer. The story goes that a young boy was sacrificed at the altar and, as a part of the ritual, Demarchus consumed the entrails of the boy. This transformed him into a wolf, a form he was trapped in for a decade. The only cure for this curse was for him to abstain from eating the flesh of a human again, or he would remain in wolf form for the rest of his life. The Greek geographer Persanius told another story involving the shrine of Lycaean Zeus, this time involving King Lycan of Arcadia. For Ceratops was the first to name Zeus the supreme god, and refused to sacrifice anything that had life in it, but burnt instead on the altar the national cakes which the Arthenians call Pelonai. But Lycan brought a human baby to the altar of Lycaean Zeus and sacrificed it, pouring out its blood on the altar, and according to the legend, immediately after the sacrifice, he changed from a man to a wolf. In a later retelling of this myth, in the 8th century CE, by Ovid, Zeus visits King Lycan under the disguise of a common man. The king of Arcadia wished to test Zeus's divinity, so either served him his son Nakitimos, his grandson Arcus, or a Molossian captive. Zeus, furious with the deception, destroyed King Lycan's sons with lightning bolts and transformed the king into a wolf. Ovid details the transformation of King Lycan, stating, He tried to speak, but his voice broke into a howling echo. His ravenous soul infected his jaws. His murderous longings were turned on the cattle. He still was possessed by bloodlust. His garments were changed to a shaggy coat and his arms into legs. He was now transformed into a wolf. Interestingly, it seems that historically, being cursed with lycanthropy is a punishment for a particular crime. The crime of murder being incomparable in contrast to the desecration of a corpse by way of cannibalism. The act of ingesting another human meaning one has lowered themselves to the level of a beast who wouldn't think twice about indulging in such an act, calls for the individual to inhabit the form of such a creature. A sin so debasing, one no longer has the privilege of possessing human form, and instead must become the scavenger that picks at rotting flesh. Arcadia seems to have a particular connection with man-wolf transformations, as Euanthus tells, 
saying that once a year, a man from the Anthonus clan was chosen by Lot and, after hanging his clothes on an oak tree, would swim across the marsh and by the time he had reached the other side, he was transformed into a wolf. Echoing the tale of Demarcus, if he refrained from eating human flesh for a decade and swam back across the marsh, his human form would be recovered. Ancient Roman mythology, similarly to Greek, stated that Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome, were adopted and nursed by a she-wolf, alluding to the founders' inclusion into a wolf-worshipping tribe. Many Roman writers in this time would refer to werewolves as Vespelis, meaning turnskin. The Satyrcon, named after the mythical creature, see the Bard, the Entertainer Through History video on this channel, is a collection of stories written by the Roman Gaius Petronius in the 1st century CE. One of the narratives features Nicoros, a travelling soldier, and the shock he endures as his travelling companion dramatically transforms into a wolf whilst relieving himself in a graveyard. To quote the story, We got among the tombstones. My man went aside to look at the epitaphs. I sat down with my heart full of song and began to count the graves. This is when I looked round at my friend. He stripped himself and put all his clothes by the roadside. My heart was in my mouth, but I stood like a dead man. He made a ring of water around his clothes and suddenly turned into a wolf. Please do not think I am joking. I would not lie about this for any fortune in the world. But as I was saying, after he turned into a wolf, he began to howl and ran off into the woods. At first I hardly knew where I was. Then I went up to take his clothes, but they had all turned into stone. No one could be nearer death with terror than I was. But I drew my sword and went slaying shadows all the way till I came to my love's house. I went in like a corpse and nearly gave up the ghost. The sweat ran down my legs. My eyes were dull. I could hardly be revived. My dear Melissa was surprised to see me out so late, and said, If you had come earlier, you would have at least helped us. A wolf got into the house and worried all our sheep, and let their blood like a butcher. But he did not make a fool out of us, even though he got off, for our slave made a hole in his neck with a spear. When I heard this, I could not keep my eyes shut any longer, but at break of day I rushed to my master Gaius's house, like a defrauded publican, and when I came to the place where the clothes had turned into stone, I found nothing but a pool of blood. And when I reached home, my soldier was lying in bed like an ox, with a doctor looking at his neck. I realised that he was a werewolf, and I could not sit down to a meal with him afterwards. Not if you had killed me first. Other people may think what they like about this, but all of your guardian angels may punish me if I'm lying. Werewolves, as a lot of folkloric creatures tend to be, are contextualised for the society of that time period. No longer the wrath of a wronged god. Although the story still features a disrespect towards the dead, now the transformation is as chaotic and carnal as the satyrs who would have narrated such a story. As the Roman Empire diminished and Christianity took a foothold across Europe, the cause of what created a werewolf changed from the disrespect of a deity to the mischief of other supernatural oddities. For example, in On the City of God Against the Pagans, written in the 5th century CE, Augustine of Hippo stated that, It is very generally believed that by certain witches' spells, men may be turned into wolves. This surreal fascination of the relationship between human and wolf continued long after the civilizations of Greece and Rome diminished. In Norse mythology, Odin, the ruler of the Aesir, the Norse pantheon, is said to be devoured by a giant wolf called Fenir during the Apocalypse or Ragnarok. Criminals that were exiled from Nordic communities were referred to as Varga, the same word used to describe Fenir. These people would quickly become outlaws, preying upon travellers, scavenging and stealing when they could, just as a wolf, or those going through the Koros would. There is also a warrior class in Norse culture called the Ufendar that emulated the wolf, as the berserker emulated the bear. The Ulfendar would perform chants and rituals before battle, like a berserker would, but also paint their skin black, as a wolf's would be, as well as donning wolf pelts, howling and biting their shields to intimidate the enemy. The 8th century poet Hornclose Ravensong describes their ferocity. Wolf coats they called them that in battle, bellow into bloody shields. They wear wolf hides when they come into the fight 
and clash their weapons together. Interestingly, these pelts would not have been acquired by hunting, as the wolf was sacred to these warriors. Instead, they would have been claimed from a wolf that deceased from natural causes. These rituals were most probably an evolution of the Koros rites. In Saga of the Volsungs, Sigmund takes his son Sindflontil out into the wilderness to hunt and pillage, for to become a fully trained warrior, Sinfontil must come to know his true animal nature, the wild animal within him, writes Gunn Monstertir. They came across a house, and after sneaking in, found two men in a magically deep sleep. Above their heads were two wolf pelts, which the father and son swiftly stole. Upon wearing them, they were unable to take them off for ten days, and howled as wolves did, but both knew the meaning of this howling. A physical transformation is not specifically mentioned, but the pair came to inhabit the attributes and primal ferocity of wolves, as they went on individual killing sprees. When they met again, Sigmund became furious with Sinfontil, and attacked him, tearing at his throat. Sigmund realises his folly, and after carrying Sinfontil back to the house, a flying raven, possibly Odin, delivers him a leaf that fixes Sinfontil's neck wound. They then wait until they can take the pelts off, and then later burn them. King Canut, born in 990 CE, and whose kingdom spanned England, Denmark, and Norway, firmly believed in the existence of werewolves, stating codes in his exolatal ordinances so that the madly audacious werewolf do not too widely devastate, nor bite too many of the spiritual flock. Gerald of Wales's Werewolves of Ossery, found in his Topographia Hibernica, written around 1188 CE, and in Gervases of Tilbury's Otia Imperiala of the early 13th century CE, continues to represent werewolves as real, living, breathing creatures. These works were specifically written for the noble class, and, considering legislation would have been written to protect humanity against this perceived menace, would further act as a confirmation bias to the existence of these monsters. Gervais reveals that werewolf belief was widespread in Europe, and when detailing the transformation, says K. Ista Daunakunta, which translates as, it is known. Later, he also writes, in England, we have often seen men change into wolves. Interestingly, werewolves were considered a usually masculine transformation, as women were considered to turn into cats and snakes instead. A specifically English werewolf folktale is that of the Werewolf of Longendale, based in the northwest of England in the modern-day Peak District. During the reign of King Henry II, he bespoke the monks of Basinwork Abbey in Wales, the nearby town of Golsup. Because of this, the abbot would occasionally hold court, where he would collect rent, tithes, and hear the grievances of the peasants who inhabited the estate. During this time, a widow came to him, overwhelmed with tears, saying that her husband and children had been killed by a powerful witch who was now attempting to murder her. Going further, she said that the witch could shape change into any animal, bird or human it wished, and so evaded capture. The abbot gifted the widow bread and arms, and then exclaimed, The eye of God that sees all shall see this wicked woman in whatever form she may be wearing here and now. From this moment on, she shall remain in that form, never being able to revert to human or any other form until the time justice is done and she has paid for her sins. By happenstance, that day, King Henry II was hunting nearby in the royal forest with many nobles and accompanied by his son, Prince Henry. Earlier that day, the Lord of Longendale slew an exceedingly large and ferocious wild boar, and so the prince wished to prove his valour and find an even more deadly prey. Thanks to the abbot's righteous curse, the witch had become trapped as a giant wolf, a form she used to hunt defenceless peasants. The werewolf laid in wait as Prince Henry approached the deepest, darkest part of the forest, and at the opportune moment, the werewolf charged the unprepared prince. Luckily, at the last minute, the prince's steed jolted to the right in a primal defence, and this allowed Prince Henry to stab his spear deep into the wolf's ribs. This monster swiftly bit the spear in two, knocking the prince off his horse, and as the creature leapt back, it let out an unnervingly human cry. What occurred next was a feral wrestling match, as the prince rolled about in the dirt, desperately stabbing the werewolf in the neck and chest as he held the monster's gnashing jaws at bay. He could feel his own strength waning 
as the creature climbed on top of him, its teeth clacking inches away from his unprotected neck. As this was occurring, the Baron of Ashton heard the commotion and hastily made way to assist the prince. He managed to gain the werewolf's attention, and after multiple charges from it, his sword was brought down upon the wolf's head, cleaving its skull in half. The body of the beast was then taken to the baron's castle, and he was congratulated by the king for his valiant effort. Upon the court hearing the noble duo's battle, a humble forester, someone employed by the lord to manage the game on his lands, came forth and said, If it may please my lords, I have something to say that may have interest to you concerning this strange and wild beast. As one of his royal foresters, it is my duty to seek out and put a stop to those who dare poach my king's game. Having concealed myself in thick bushes, I lay quietly in wait, hoping to catch a certain poacher in the act. As I lay waiting, I was startled by a strange and ghoulish wailing. On creeping through the forest to its source, I was astounded to see a werewolf tearing and clawing at its very own skin. It was as if it desired to shed it quickly, such as a person would undress themselves. Its cries were both hideous and pitiful and I thought it sounded like a twisted version of an old woman's voice. Human or other, it was a cracked and hideous cry that it uttered. I am afraid that upon seeing and hearing this, my courage failed. I fled as fast and as far as I could from this frightful thing, before its attention should fall upon myself. A banquet was held to honour the slaying of this terrible beast, and upon arriving, the abbot of Bassingwork was certain this creature was in fact the witch he had cursed earlier that day. He later took the widow under his protection, and she lived the rest of her days in comfort. The hysteria from folktales such as this most probably motivated King Edward's decision in 1281 CE, when he ordered the extermination of all wolves in his kingdom. This call would take centuries to complete, with wolves being eradicated from England in 1680 CE, and completely exterminated from the British Isles in 1786 CE. Werewolf tales would continue long after the indigenous wolf was eradicated from Britain. During the 1600s in East Yorkshire, northern England, there was a folk tale of Old Stinker, a werewolf of over seven foot tall that had red eyes and a particularly pungent smelly breath. Amazingly, there are still sightings of Old Stinker to this day. Bisclavet, or The Werewolf, is one of many short narratives that Marie de France translated from Breton during the 12th century. The story tells of Bisclavet, a baron of Brittany who was beloved by his king, and who could not be found for three days out of the week. In time, his wife begs him to reveal where he goes, and he admits to being a werewolf, and must hide his clothing to be able to return to human form. Instead of sympathy, his wife is so shocked that she states that she does not want to lie beside him anymore. The wife then conspires with a knight who had her affection, and the next time Bliskovec transforms, the knight steals his clothing, trapping him in his werewolf form. The baron's people search for him to no avail, and in time, his wife marries the knight she colluded with. A year later, the king is out hunting in the woods, and his dog's corner what appears to be a wolf. Instead of being ferocious, though, the wolf is noble and gentle, and kisses the foot of the king. Later, a feast is held, and the knight who betrayed Bisclavet is invited. As he arrives, the wolf jumps at him, and the king calls for the wolf to back down. The king then takes the wolf to the same castle Bisclavet used to own, and upon seeing his wife, the wolf attacks her, tearing off her nose. A wise man points out that the king's wolf companion has only attacked the knight and his new wife, the same woman who has a missing husband. The wife is then tortured and eventually relinquishes the location of Bisclavet's clothing. The wolf is then given the clothing, and at first he seems to ignore it. The wise man then tells the king's men to leave the clothing in the baron's bedchamber with the wolf, and once given privacy, the wolf puts on the baron's clothing and he returns to human form, to the king's delight. The deceptive wife and knight are then banished from the kingdom, and apparently their children are born without noses, in a similar appearance to their mother. In Ireland, werewolves are associated with royal lineages. The people of prehistoric Ireland would engage in a cultural practice called Fianna, remarkably similar to the Koros rites of prehistoric Europeans. Whilst roaming as a warband, the group would be referred to as Luchon, literally wolfskins. 
whilst the actual act of being a roaming warband was referred to as going wolfing. Nennius of Banger's Historia Britonium, or A History of the Britons, describes men who can transform their consciousnesses into that of a wolf, leaving their human bodies behind. Their human forms at this time are exceptionally vulnerable, and those in the vicinity of them are told not to move them, for if the body was moved, the consciousness may not be able to return. During this time, meat that the wolf ate could appear in the mouths of the human, and any injury sustained to the wolf would be replicated on the human's body. Werewolf tales on the European continent continued well past the medieval age, into the Renaissance. This is because the wolf population was inherently harder to eradicate, especially in Eastern Europe, as any culling would simply open up the opportunity for more wolves to migrate from Mongolia and Siberia. In Western Europe, the wolf was inhabiting the forest into the 1930s, whilst Norway's last wolf was killed in 1973. There are several recorded accounts of werewolves from France and Germany in the early modern era. In 1521 CE, Pierre Bougot and Michael Verdun were arrested for brutally murdering several children. They admitted to having sworn allegiance to the devil and claimed to have used a special ointment to turn themselves into wolves. It is unknown whether the confession was conjured by the medium of torture or if the men were in fact mentally ill, but regardless, they were burnt at the stake for their sins. The werewolf of Dole, also known as Giles Garnier, was another man who claimed to have transformative ointments. He had apparently killed and eaten several children in his wolf form, and similarly to others, was burnt to death for his crimes. It appears that, whether this act was conducted because of psychotic malice or mental illness, the suspect was deemed a werewolf. This is most probably because of the circular logic that anyone who would do such a hideous crime could not be human because of the inherent animalistic ferocity of such a crime. The Bedberg werewolf, also known as Peter Stubb, is widely regarded as Germany's most prolific werewolf. He was blamed for a string of killings in the city of Bedberg by the testimony of hunters who chased him, could change himself into a wolf. Under torture, he confessed to killing and eating animals, men, women and children, as well as owning a wolf hide belt which allowed his transformation. From a modern vantage point, it is easily obvious how a cultural panic and psychosis fueled this werewolf hunt. Across the Atlantic, indigenous Americans regarded the wolf as a fellow hunter who was to be respected and admired. Some tribes also believed that transforming into such an animal was possible. The Hopi peoples are one of America's oldest tribes. One of their many rites is referred to as the Yaya, and despite little being shared about this practice, one aspect that is known is the wearing of a particular animal's fur one wishes to transform into. The Mohawk people, whose lands covered New York to southern Quebec, called those that transformed Limakin, whilst the Navajo people called them Yenadalushi, or Skinwalker, which more accurately translates as he who goes on all fours. These people would look identical to the normal person, but their eyes would appear large and glowing like a wolf's wood against firelight. These terrifying eyes were the conduit for transformation, as if you were to look a skinwalker in them, they would gain the power to transform into you. Furthermore, their skin would be rock hard, impervious to cutting, and they had no genitalia to speak of. Some tales say they also had dark tongues, a physical representation of their indoctrination into dark forces. Their powers were more diverse than simply changing into wolves, as they could transform into any animal that caught their stare. Werewolves, ultimately, are so much more than just the folk tales we would tell our children as we cuddled together for warmth in hovels centuries ago. There is a reason this creature has stalked us from our own subconscious, moons before civilization could ever be imagined. What these creatures truly represent is an acknowledgement that we are far from the sole carnivorous wardens of this land. That, despite our lofty ambitions, pomposity and performed civility, we are still at whim to our base hormonal and chemical urges. That if stripped away from our cotton and cured pelts, we would quickly descend back to that ferocious monster that still haunts us, lying deep in our consciousnesses, hibernating, awaiting to re-emerge. After all, as the Cherokee saying goes, there aren't two people, or two sheep, 
or two dogs inside of you, but two wolves. <laughs>